This has been one busy week here at Truth to Ponder. And today it's time to shift some gears and find some real hope. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. This has been one strange week in many ways for the program, Truth to Ponder. On Monday, I felt very led to get up Monday morning and share from my heart some very important thoughts that were on my mind. I pray about this program quite a bit. And I know at times it it sounds a bit like a broken record when we're talking about some of the same issues over and over again, but let me just give you a few reasons why we may do that from time to time. New listeners, of course, that may have not heard what we said two or three weeks ago. And knowing that our mainstream media, if they're hitting 50% truth and accuracy, that's a lot more than they probably really are. CNN, MSNBC, many of us know them to be basically a propaganda arm. I can remember just little stories like, oh, I don't know, last April, hydroxychloroquine, bad, it kill you, and now suddenly it's good again. It was all for a political narrative. I try to bring guests on that do their research on information to share with you. Some of these are basically guesses, the best guesses we can come up with. Sometimes we're right on it. Other times we may come up short. But it's hard getting accurate information. You know it, and I know it. One of my one of my listeners wrote an email, I think it was last week, and said, Bob, what you really need to do from time to time, maybe not every day, but every once in a while you need to just stop and and get away from the depressing news, the fake numbers, and all the stuff we're dealing with. People are, are paying a dear and heavy price for what's going on in our world today. And and maybe maybe what you need to do is spend some time sharing some good news. But most important sharing some hope and you know he he was right I need to do more of that it's one thing to just be a news program and and talking about certain issues but if I'm not giving you hope if I'm not giving you the alternative if I'm not giving you a better way then what's the purpose of a show like this there is no real purpose when we stop sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and we stop sharing some some hope so maybe maybe it's time to take us back to a time when maybe more of us felt a little more hopeful it was a time that I swore I would never go back I was blind to the truth didn't know what I had I was running I was searching but every place I turned for healing Left me more broken than the last Take me back To the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back To a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church Trying to walk on my own, but I wound up lost Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross It's not a trophy for the winners It's a shelter for the sinners And it's right where I belong Take me back to the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church I want to go to church
back home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church This week, my wife and I have been talking about this this year that's gone by. And we look at each other and we go, where did a whole year go? I mean, it just up and vanished in no time. A year ago, back in the month of February, which we're just about to finish out this weekend. A year ago, we were just beginning now to really hear about the intensity of the virus. I'm not going to say much about it. You know, you know, you know the rest of the story. I know that a couple of weeks before I had preached a message that was entitled, you know, Fear Not. And I was going to actually share a different sermon that day for that church. I was prepared totally on a different topic and I got there and it was just ringing loud in my head. Remember, in the beginning of February, we really hadn't had anybody die yet. Maybe a a few people, I think, were involved with a cruise ship. We really didn't have any known infections. We didn't have any real way to test. We really still don't, but you know the story. And we were just beginning to get bits and pieces. We have been told that this is maybe not infectious. It, it's going to be just fine, uh, but we're working on it. You kind of remember that attitude? Well, that's not really what was going on. I knew that. Many in emergency management have been called out of our, you know, to, to go back to work. I came out of retirement. And I didn't know what to expect. By this time, one year ago, I had some numbers that had been shared with me of what we were to expect in this country and what we thought was going to happen, the place I had been asked to go help and serve, the numbers were were frightening. I mean, frightening beyond words. And how are we going to deal with this? I can remember getting in my car and, and my wife is with our daughter, our and, and I'm heading to another state, and I don't know how long I'm going to be gone. Am I going to be gone three weeks, three months, a year? I don't know. I really didn't know. And, and I'll be honest, I was deeply concerned on how we're going to deal with the reality that we were being told we're going to have. And in good faith, did all my paperwork, and off I went. First time I'd gone in, you know, you wanted to go to a, like a fast food place, all the dining rooms were suddenly closed. And checking into a hotel, you had to do it from a table, maybe about eight feet away from somebody. This is before we even had face masking and all this other stuff. It was a time where we didn't know what to expect. Many churches suspended worship services, thinking it's only going to be highly temporary. And now there are a lot of people, they, they frankly miss their church for whatever reason. And their churches are not wanting to get back together again or meet. And honestly, honestly, I find that, inf- I find that troubling that Christians are afraid to gather because of the virus. And, and I know some of you are saying, but Bob, but Bob, you know, it, it's serious. In the first century, being a Christian was serious. In the second, third, and fourth, very serious. If you were caught worshiping, you could die. They could kill you. They could imprison you. They could take everything from you. It was a lot worse than a virus. 
in the early church. And now we have people that are missing their church. Well, it's time for the church to be the church. Let me say that again. It is time for the church to be the church. It's time for people that claim the name of Christ to truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people talk about believing in Jesus. But I want to share something from Scripture with you right now. I want to take you to the book of Acts. I remember studying this this book during the time of my seminary training. And the more I studied the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and putting maps and getting an understanding of what was happening at that time, you recognize the church was up against a lot of opposition. And, and one of the things that there's a story told, there was a slave girl and this is in chapter 16, if you want to look up, uh, starting at verse 16. As Paul and Silas, remember them? Paul was traveling with Silas, and they they went to prayer, and then a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who bought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. And what happened, to just kind of jump ahead here, they realized this was an evil spirit possessing this young girl. And they prayed in the name of Jesus for that spirit to come out. And the masters that owned that slave girl were very upset because now she didn't have this uh, spirit of divination. And they're not going to make any money. And so they grabbed them, took them before the leaders of the city, and said they're, they're teaching customs that are not lawful, being Romans for us to receive or observe. And the magistrates, I mean... They, they were beaten with rods, and they were thrown into prison. It's a little bit serious, isn't it? How many, how many of us would take the risk of going to jail by going to church? And it's interesting. They're in prison. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God in prison. And the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly... It was like a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken and the doors opened and everybody's chains fell off. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was going to kill himself. Now, let me explain something. This jailer was going to die if he lost all those prison, the prisoners. That's just how it was back in that time. You got paid well to be a jailer, but you don't lose your prisoners or you pay dearly. And Paul called out with a loud voice, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. He called for a light and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he bought them out and, and the jailer looks at these two and he suddenly really realizes, what do I do to be saved? Now, this answer that they give, in some translations, I don't think they render it as good as it needs to be rendered, and I'm about to explain why. Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all those who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, they washed their stripes, because remember, these guys have been beaten. And then he and his family were baptized. And Now, where some translations, I think, miss something that's very vital as you're translating from Koine and Greek into, into English, a lot just, you know, a lot of translations render it, you know, believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And in is really not the best word for this. Let me explain why. It's easy for anybody, and listen to me carefully. This is very important for, I know somebody right now will, will, will get this, maybe for the first time in their life. How many of us believe in something? Many people 
who are Christians say they believe in Jesus. They believe in this, that, or the other. But the word believe on is a, is much stronger, and let me explain why. When I was a young man, young child actually, I believed in in aircraft that were flying above my head. I could see some, but there are a lot of aircraft that I I have been told you cannot see with your eyes because they're so high up or they're above the clouds. A lot of people can believe in, let's say, Delta Airlines or Southwest Airlines. It's easy to believe in something. You may see something in the air. You may believe something's flying over your house. But have you ever really put your faith and full trust into Southwest Airlines or Delta Airlines or any airline? Believing in something is different than believing on something. What do you mean, Bob? What do you mean there's something different between believing in something and believing on something? Here's a simple way to put it. To believe in something requires no risk. It requires nothing. You just assume. I can say I believe in, for example, about a month or so ago, I flew to Texas. Now, I can say that I believe in United Airlines or American Airlines, or whatever the airline was that I was flying. But until I actually bought the ticket, went to the airport, went through security, buckled myself in the seat, the plane took off, and headed to Texas, now I'm believing on them. I'm putting my full faith and trust in this airline to take me from the airport that I got on in in South Carolina and to get me all the way to West Texas. See, to believe in something, you never use it. You've never depended upon it fully. And and that is the problem with too many in the church today. They may believe in something. They may believe that, you know, Jesus is present in communion or whatever the case may be. But until you really put your faith on it, how many people have been afraid to I was watching a church that I'm familiar with. I'm not going to say the name. It was online. And they have those stupid little new things that a lot of churches have that I don't like. It's got the little little grape juice and the little itty-bitty chiclet-type bread all in one happy container. You, you peel off the top layer. There's your bread. You peel off the next layer, and there's your little grape juice. And this way you don't worry about getting the virus from communion. In other words, nobody's touched it. And it's kind of like, do you really think that Jesus wants to have you come to church and participate in something that he gave as a gift to the church so it will kill you? I don't think so. See, the problem with with many, they call themselves Christians. They believe more on politics and ballot boxes than they do on the Lord Jesus Christ. They may believe in Jesus, but they believed on, and and I'm not, don't get me wrong here. I'm not throwing off on anybody. They believed in a politician, I'll put it that way, or a person running for office. They put their faith because they went and voted for that individual. And they thoroughly thought of that individual goes into office and the world to get fixed. They don't put as much faith in their church and their and their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as they do into their politics or into the things that they can understand. So let's get back to this thing in Acts. This so here we are. The family's baptized, and now, now we're going to come to the next day. And it was that day the magistrates sent the officers and said, let those men go. So the keeper reported these words, saying, the magistrates have sent, said to let me go and therefore depart in peace. In other words, keep quiet. And Paul couldn't, rep- couldn't depart in secret. He had to tell of the things that the Lord hath done. Many times we keep so much of our faith to ourselves. It's kind of a, 
someone will make a statement. Have you ever heard this one before? This one really gets under my skin at times. You know, oh, my religion is very personal to me. I don't talk about it. Really? Well, yes, you know, my my faith is very, very personal, and I, I just kind of keep it to myself. That that really does fly in the face of, of a lot of Scripture. You know, if you're not willing to testify before others the name of Jesus, wow, there's some Scripture you need to read. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32. Whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. We say that again. This is what Jesus said. This is not what Bob says or some preacher says or some book said. This is what our Lord said. Whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him I will confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. In other words, anyone who confesses and acknowledges me before other people as Lord and Savior, affirming that state of oneness, in other words, that I am, I belong to Christ, that's the one I'll confess before my Father, our Heavenly Father, who's in heaven. And so many say, oh, I can't do that. I, I want to keep it personal. I don't want to bother anybody with this. It's all, it's all secret and personal to me. Why? What are you ashamed of? I can remember this, this one hymn that I, as a child, and, and, and as I was growing up in a church, every once in a while, I, I'd read the words of a hymn. You know, as a little kid, you're hearing them, and all of a sudden, one day, the light goes off, and you suddenly pick up a message, and I'm talking as just maybe someone that's like 9, 10, or 11, or 12, and that, and that, and it's like, at a young age, it suddenly hits me as I heard the words of this hymn. Jesus and shall it Ashamed of thee, ashamed of thee, whom angels praise, whose glory shine through endless days. Ashamed of Jesus. A 
Savior slain, and oh may this my glory be, that Christ is not ashamed of me. As a young child, I heard the words. I'm sure that we had sung that hymn a number of times in the past. And when you're young, you don't tie all the concepts together. And suddenly in this young boy's heart, I realized what it meant that people were ashamed of Jesus They didn't want to mention his name. They didn't want to embarrass themselves before other people. In other words, they wouldn't, they didn't want to confess him before their friends, you know. They might, friends might laugh at them. And I'm thinking, how could anybody be ashamed of the Jesus that came to redeem you and bring you the hope of everlasting life? And he gave his life for you that you might have life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't understand it, even as a youngster. And as I've grown older, I've looked at times in my own life where I realized that I compromised or I realized I could have shared and I didn't or I realized, you know, I want to keep it to myself. You know, that idea, you know, my faith is private. In other words, you just don't want to, you don't want to get into the discussion. And oftentimes the reason many people will will say that, they'll have, there's two reasons primarily that come to my mind. They don't know enough about God's Word to even begin to discuss anything with somebody else to share. In in the little story I shared before from the book of Acts, St. Paul and Silas, they shared with that jailer and his family that night the things of God, the plan of salvation, who Jesus Christ is, and how to believe on and fully put your trust in him. And something tells me over time as that jailer grew in the Lord, he was not ashamed of his Jesus. Those that were were taken to the Colosseum in Rome because they were Christians, because they were Christians, they became the entertainment as, as wild beasts and lions tore them and ripped them apart and killed them. Yet, The thing that annoyed Rome over time is these people are not recanting their faith. They're given an opportunity to live, and they won't do it. After a while, the spectacle grew old. It wasn't as fun anymore. It wasn't as entertaining. There's some stories out there. Some of the accuracy is debatable. But in time, the idea of just bringing Christians in to be killed by wild beasts got old. But Christians have been persecuted, hated for the name of Jesus' sake since the time of Jesus. He warned us. And today, the American church has had it so easy. So easy. They really don't know what troubled times mean. In just a little while, we're going to take a break. But I want to share with you some other music. And I'm thinking that today, a little bit of music is something we need in these very difficult times. Some things to encourage you. You know, it's time that we get ready for the things to come. People get ready. There's a train coming. You don't.
take a break and we'll be right back this is truth to ponder with bob beerman anger and the heavenly gate shalom alechem this is the nice jewish boy jonathan khan your jewish connection bringing you the riches of your jewish roots in jesus now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you're going to get and love in a moment now what will the kingdom of god be like well, in Isaiah 60, it's written, Your gates will always be open. They'll never be shut day or night, so that men may bring you the wealth of nations. So, in the book of Revelation, it's also written, On no day will its gates in heaven ever be closed, for there will be no night there. You see, one of the main characteristics of heaven is the open gate. What does it mean? It means there's no more need for closing or defensiveness or walls. There's no more war or fear or anger or conflict or condemnation. The gates are open. If heaven is characterized by an open gate, then if you want to live a heavenly life, your life too has to be characterized by an open gate or rather an open heart. See, whenever you judge somebody, whenever you hold a grudge, whenever you refuse to forgive, whenever your heart is filled with conflict, your life becomes a closed gate. And when you have a closed gate, no blessings can get in. A closed gate isn't a heavenly gate. And a closed will will prevent you from ever knowing the heavenly life you were meant to know. So whenever you close your heart in bitterness or anger or self-pity or conflict and strife, the one you cripple the most is yourself because you're closing the gate, not only to them, but to God's love and to all the blessings he wants to give your life. You want to live a heavenly life? There's only one way. Open the gate. Open the gate of anger. Open the gate of bitterness. Open the gate of self-pity and unforgiveness. Repent, forgive, love. Open the gate of your life. Then the treasures of God's love will flow into your heart and your life will become like heaven. Want more? Ask for The Open Gate on CD. Now the free gift for you. From the sands of the Judean wilderness to the wings of the cherubim, an awesome, long-hidden mystery now revealed the mystery of the temple doors on CD. You'll love it. And Sapphire is guaranteed to bless your socks off. Is that how you get all these free gifts? Easy. Just remember Jesus' real Hebrew name, Yeshua, and dial it. Just dial one 800 Yeshua 1. You'll be so blessed, but call now. 1-800-Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Now, I invite you to minister with me. Together, bringing salvation to God's chosen people, Israel, and to the unreached peoples of all nations of five continents with over a billion people. Just call now. 1-800-Yeshua 1. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Or write me direct. The Nice Jewish Boy, Box 1111, Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. 
That's the nice Jewish boy. That's box 1111. That's Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, in the zip 07644. Well, till next time, this is Jonathan Khan saying Shalom Aleichem. Peace be to you, my friend, in Messiah Sar Chaim, the Prince of Life. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to the second part of our program today. Almost a little late on that break, but but I'm glad that you're with me. Today is just messages and thoughts of hope in a very troubled time. As I said at the beginning of the program, I want to remind you again, if you're just tuning in, on Monday... If you listen to the Monday through Friday version or Monday through Thursday, some only hear this once a week on the weekend, and I understand that. If you want to hear these other programs, and if you have the ability of getting online, you can hear the prior programs from our website, truth2ponder.com, truth2ponder.com. And there you can find prior programs and this past monday in particular is what i want to share with you i had planned to do the show very differently than i did and and i had one of those nights where i was tossing and turning could not fully sleep and and i just kept hearing this voice with this theme shining the light of truth We always talk about that as part of this program. But finding truth in a world full of lies. Finding real truth in a world full of lies. When I started this program at the end of August, hard to believe that right now this program completes, are you ready for this, six months of doing truth to ponder. Six months. When I started the program, I had a friend that, said, you ought to give it a try. And I'm going, no, I, I, I have a hard enough time doing just a weekend show. What do you mean you want me to do this five days a week? And he said, but Bob, you know, you could do this, do it for a while, like between, you know, September, October, and maybe up until the election. And I said, I don't know. Let me Let me think about it. And I had thought about doing this program, but it just seemed something that was going to be very difficult for me to do as an as just an individual you know it's not the airtime is not free and this is going to be an issue i'm retired i mean god has taken care of my need but i'm not wealthy enough to be buying airtime on one or two and maybe someday three or four shortwave radio facilities i'm just that's not that's not what i thought but he said, if I, if I guarantee that I'll get you covered into the first month or so, would you do it? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. And so we did. And the program launched on Monday. It was the last day of August, so really, you know, 1st of September for all practical purposes. And we've been doing a program every day since, Monday through Friday. God has sent some unusual and very talented guests along the way. They have things to share. Do I always agree with everybody? No. But we're trying to give you information to do some research for yourself. I've come to conclude several things, and I said this at the beginning of the program. Our mainstream media is 50% or better inaccurate or so biased as to change a story's entire meaning or they carefully edit things out so it gives a different impression of what the real facts were telling. We see that in this pandemic. We see it in our politics. We see it in the voter situation in this country. You will never convince me that Joe Biden legitimately got 80 million votes, beating the number of votes that any president has ever gotten in history. I'm not going to believe it because it's too much of a fantasy to believe. Do I believe there were irregularities that were conceived and planned to 
to make things go a certain way? Absolutely. The pandemic got used royally for that purpose. It gave rise to things we never would have done before. And we did. So I bring on guests from time to time, and they'll share their thoughts about the virus, the vaccines, and everything. You may not agree with all of it, and that's fine. I'm not trying to be a sensationalist here. If that helps any, somebody wrote, and I, I, I concur, you know, I don't want to be like an Alex Jones. I mean, the guy, for him, this is a business, and I'm not throwing off totally on him. I'm just saying... I'm doing this as a ministry, not a business. I don't have a staff. It's me, my Lord, and a few friends that try to find me information. But as we finish out this month of February and get into this transitional month of March in the Northern Hemisphere, as we're soon to say goodbye to old man winter, I hope and say hello to spring. I'm feeling we've spent a lot of time during the month of February talking about a lot of very depressing things. And yeah, we'll talk about some of those things, I hate to say, from time to time. But but the Lord really laid in my heart. I, I decided, I did that program on Monday talking about finding truth in an increasingly world full of lies. And then I I realized that what I wanted to do was I I just kind of wanted to finish it out, you know, put it all out there. The best information, the speculation, the possibilities, let you look at it, listen to it, pray about it, decide for yourself. But starting, starting in the month of March, we're going to switch gears a little bit for a while. We're still going to bring you the news and information and and kind of a, a countdown to the nonsense that is condemning our world but also to prepare I don't care what anybody says if you think your church is going back to the way it was most of them will probably never be the same again I also believe the cancel culture is going to continue to grow And people are going to become afraid to say or do anything. They'll just try to go along to get along. I see a lot of that coming in the not-too-distant future. If the church is, as the term that's used today, is woke enough, they'll be fine. Because they're buying into all the man-made nonsense, the man-centered irrelevance, and the worship of the planet over the worship of an almighty God. And they'll be just fine. Those that truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are going to be increasingly, you know, you're, you're to this, you're to that, you're, you know, you're, you're racist, you're homophobic, you're, you're xenophobic, uh, you're transphobic, whatever new phobic they come up with. And many people are not going to want to be associated with those kind of places because it's going to hurt their personal careers, their jobs, their business. And they will be like the rich man when he heard the wonderful word of God and realized he had to leave it behind. He couldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. There's going to be a separation of the sheep and the goats, and it's already started. This pandemic has separated those that really put their faith on the Lord or their faith in or on Dr. Fauci or the latest political whim of the day. The church is going to have to get ready for a different model over time. And while we have the time now, now is the time to prepare for a smaller church, to be quite honest, in many places. Maybe not meeting in the conventional ways as to attract a lot of attention and bringing people in to want you like in Canada arrested for saying the wrong thing. Or how dare you get a few people to pray during the corona scare. 
you can't pray. It's like I mentioned in France. There was a lot of angst over this one thing that came out in the news. You know, these people, they won't acknowledge that the law of France is greater than the law of God. What's wrong with these people? No, what's wrong with France? What is horribly wrong with France? Peter said it, and let's be clear about this for those of you that say, we have to obey the edicts of everything they're saying about the virus because it's all for our own good. That's what they told the Jews getting on the the trains. You're going to a safe place. It's for your own good. You vermin. We have people that we have to obey because the Bible, the Bible also says anytime the authority and laws of men contradict the word of God, you go with the word of God and you do not go with any law in contradiction to God's word. Peter said it clearly. The apostles were definitive on this. There was no there was no shyness about it at all. The church needs to be the church again. The church needs to worship again. The church needs to realize we serve a sovereign God again. We don't serve a committee. We don't serve just a denomination. We serve an almighty and living God. And we need to learn to worship him fully in spirit and in truth and acknowledge him as our Lord and Sovereign. Lord, I bow before your holy throne, pouring my heart to you in worship. Lord, I
You are the greatest Lord. You are the greatest Lord. the greatest the greatest Lord greater than cancer greater than any disease greater than depression greater than any fear The Greatest Lord, the first time I ever, ever heard that piece of music. It just moved me in, in, a, in a very unusual way because it, the words are not thin. The words are not just repetitive. The words are not just talking about an unknown entity. So many of what passes for Christian music today, oh, we talk about him or you or whatever and they're afraid to say the name of Jesus in the song and this one she is saying the name of Jesus in her song maybe you like this style maybe you don't but I love the words I love the message it's a message the church has lost sight of in too many places I said earlier on the program I reminded you of what Jesus told his disciples and tells us today. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. He tells us in his word to put our faith, our hope, and our trust in and on him. Not just You know, for this sweet by and by down the road some other day. But for the here and now, today, this life, this world. Please understand. If you think we're going back to the world we knew sometime this spring and everything will be the same all over again, you are wrong. We will not. Of course, I know Truthfully, things will improve, but the fear is wonderful to keep people under control. Control the narrative. Those that hate our Lord Jesus Christ, those that despise his name, those that despise those that claim his name and want to silence you, the cancel culture is coming after the church. If you don't think it is, it already has started. It's already happened in Europe, it's happened in the UK, it is happening in Canada, and even in the United States, it's beginning to happen. And with the current administration in office, the current makeup of the House and the Senate, the current compromised Supreme Court, in my opinion, compromised, your freedoms are going to gradually keep eroding if you want to worship the Spirit of God, if you want to worship God in spirit and truth, you may not be able to do it in the ways and places you did in the past. Now, some parts of the country will be easier to work in than others. That's just the way it's going to be. We started this program six months ago, and this broadcast completes six months, and we, we go into a new month On Monday, for those that listen to the Monday through Friday broadcast and not just the weekend, we start a whole new month, a whole new half year. And we're going to look back on where we are, where we're going. We'll continue to bring you news and information. And as somebody said to me, and and I understand that I, I don't want to come off as just some sensationalistic guy on the radio. There's no 
no need to do that. My, my only reason to bring you some of these things you may not hear or may not even get a fair discussion to find out if they're accurate or fully accurate or only partially accurate is so you have more than just the established controlled narrative which has changed week in and week out. That's why the program is here. But I've been praying and I know that on our Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday broadcast we hit a lot of these issues hard. You may have agreed, you may not. That's fine. But really what I want to get into starting next week are messages and topics to help you prepare for the days ahead. And see, here's what I can tell you. I don't run a compound or a complex, and there's no place for you to go and give me your money. That's not what I'm doing. It's not what God's called me to do. I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to help guide you to what God's Word has said and what, what people are feeling and hearing and let you decide and figure it out. Giving you real truth to work with so you can have something to hold on to. We're going to share messages of hope and overcoming the things of this world. We've been doing this program now. We finish up six months. And by God has been faithful. We're ready to go into the month of March. Thanks be to God for that. And we'll see what stations we will continue with. Maybe we'll add different ones. We'll, we'll see as time goes by. And as the, as the support allows. I'm still looking at podcast options. I'm going to be making some changes in the very... I'm beginning to think this thing through. And I'm going to make a few changes in the podcasting and, and develop a backup podcast system that doesn't depend on certain companies. It just has to be done. If you believe in the ministry we have here at Truth to Ponder, go to the website, truth2ponder.com. You can find out more about us, even support us from there. If you'd prefer to mail a small check to help, it only goes to airtime. None of it goes to me. I promise, none goes to me. You can mail it to, uh, make the check payable to Ancient Word Radio, Ancient Word Radio, and mail it to 21 Berkshire Lane, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, in Sky Valley, Georgia. And by the way, our zip code here is 30537. Address again, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth. To ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.